Okay, um, welcome everybody to our lecture this evening on imbalance, dizziness, and vertigo. My name is Frank Miles. I will be your moderator this evening, and I am a member of the Miracle of Living Planning Committee. Our, we'll introduce our speakers not all at once, but just before they speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Mon Quen Wong. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan Medical School. After completing his medical degree, he decided to specialize in neurology and completed his neurology residency and neurophysiology Fe fellowship at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He is board certified in neurology and subspecializes in neurophysiology. He is fluent in Mandarin Chinese and in Taiwanese. Prior to entering medical school, he was an engineer and worked for a Fortune 500 company in Silicon Valley and interacted with customers worldwide. He believes a good physician is a good healer as well as a good communicator. In his spare time, he enjoys reading, traveling, and spending time with family. Dr. Wong. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, go to get started. So I'm going to talk to you about dizziness, vertigo, and imbalance. This is one of the most common diagnoses that I see in my clinic. Up to 20% of patients that I see every day come to see me for this particular issue. So today I'm going to talk to you about my thinking process when I see a patient with this particular complaint. I first will get a history from the patient. I'll do some physical exam depending on what the patient is telling me. And also I'll tell you my thinking process on arriving at common diagnosis. So before I start about my thinking process, I want to give you some background regarding where the sen our sense of balance comes from. So the sense of balance in us comes from three organs. One is our eyes, the second is our inner ear, and the third is our joint and muscles. Our brain, louder? Okay. So our brain will incorporate from all these three inputs and give us a sense of balance. In general, we only need two out of three of these input to have good sense of balance. For example, we can close our eyes and we can still stand up straight without falling. And when we're driving, we still remain oriented and not dizzy with just with our eyes and in the ears. <coughs> so when I see a patient that comes to my clinic, I ask them, well, you have dizziness, but what do you mean? Tell me what you feel. Is it number one, spinning, rocking boat, feeling of sensation of movement while the environment is not moving? Or number two, lightheadedness or near fainting? Or number three, issue with balance, meaning reduce your balance while standing or walking, but you do not feel illusion of movement or lightheadedness. If you have trouble tell me, telling me what you feel, it is fine, because about to five to 10%, they cannot really tell me what they feel. They just feel, I feel dizzy, that is okay. So then I want you to tell me when you have dizziness, how often do you have it? Do you have it all the time? Do you have it coming and going? Are there any particular trigger that causes you to have dizziness? Or it comes and goes without any particular trigger? And if it comes and goes, how long does it last? Also, when it comes, do you have any other symptoms, such as hearing loss, ringing in your ear, headache, palpitation, irregular heartbeat, or, or any other symptom that occurs together with your dizziness. So once I have gathered history, then I'll move on to physical exam. So one thing, or well, the first thing I'll be looking for is to see if you have involuntary eye movement. And this is uh, what is called nystagmus. Um, so on the monitor here, you can see a patient's uh, left eye so one thing I'll ask the patient to do is to follow 
my finger. Look at my finger and follow my finger left and right. In this particular instance, I'm asking the patient to look at the right. So let me show you. Uh, over here. Okay. So the patient should be looking at the right. However, you see the eyeball moving. The eyeball should be staying still. So this is nystagmus. This is one thing that I'm looking for during my exam. Let me try to show it again. So again, the eyeball should be uh, staying still when looking at one direction. So the reason I'm looking for nystagmus is because Again, our brain incorporate all three senses together to give us a sense of balance. Our inner ear is connected to our eye. And this is a reflex that we develop throughout time. So that is, that is why when you read a book or read your phone, if you move your head left and right, you can still read it. If you're driving, you're looking straight ahead. The car is moving, however, you don't feel dizzy because your brain is getting the input from your inner ear to turn your eye to staying, staring straight ahead. Another example is, uh, another an example of this, if I turn to the left, my brain will give my eye a signal to turn to the right. So if I see nystagmus, and one thing I want to look for is which direction is the nystagmus, which direction is the abnormal moment. If it's sideways, then I'm pretty certain it's coming from the inner ear. If, if it's anything else, such as up and down or asymmetric, then it may be something wrong with the brain. So this is another test that I may do in my clinic for patients who have dizziness. So this is to test the link between the inner ear and your eye. So for this, uh, for this video, the patient is asking, the uh, doctor is asking the patient to look straight ahead at the doctor's nose. And then the patient, uh, the doctor is turning the patient's head left and right. Okay, so you can see that, oops. When the patient's head is being turned, the eyeball moves but keeps staring straight ahead. So looking straight ahead. Don't worry about it. Okay. And this test is used to stimulate the inner ear. So later in this particular video, the examiner will turn the patient's head to the left very quickly. However, the eyeball will still look straight ahead. Okay, I can pause, okay. So over there, so turn to the right really quickly. However, the eyeball is still looking straight. Okay, now turning to the right side, however, you see that delay. Her eyeball stays on the left and do not respond to this turning. <coughs> All right, so another test that I may do is called Dix Hall Pike exam. This is used to see if you have a problem with your inner ear. And this test is very simply done. Turn to the right, lean back, and then if this triggers patients who have abnormal eye movement, such as this, then patient has inner ear problem, a specific type of inner ear problem. Okay, so this is another test for the inner ear.
So the patient is li lying flat, looking to the left, and then the doctor will turn the head to the right, and you see nystagmus, abnormal eye movement. This is for a specific issue with the inner ear. <coughs> so next thing I may do in my clinic is to measure your blood pressure in three positions, lying flat, sitting, or standing. So in this particular instance, you can see that the blood pressure when you're lying, when this patient lying flat, 150 over 80, that's okay. Sitting up, drop a little bit, that is fine. Now standing up, 110 over 50. So just with that position change, this patient's blood pressure dropped 40 points. So this patient feel lightheaded. Other tests I may do is to test your, uh, the patient's sense of position. For example, I may use a tuning fork to see if your feet can feel the vibration from a tuning fork. I may use a reflex hammer to see if you have good reflex. I may ask you to simply stand with your eyes closed to see if you can do that without falling or swaying. Once I have gathered uh, a patient's history and done appropriate physical exam, I may order diagnostic testing. Most time, I don't need to because from your history and exam, I, most, most often I have an idea of what the diagnosis is. However, sometimes I may ask for these exams. In terms of blood tests, I may test for anemia, thyroid issue, adrenal issue, things of that sort. I may also ask for a hearing test because the inner ear is responsible for both hearing and balance. If you have problem with your hearing, sometimes you have problem with balance as well. CT or MRI of brain is to see if you have uh, abnormality with, in your brain that may cause you to have dizziness. VNG is a, actually one of the videos shows VNG. So that is to see if the stimulus to your inner ear uh, will lead to corresponding response in your eyes. It's a test to see you, if you have correct nystagmus. Tail table testing and ecstatic cardio monitoring are to see if you change position, your heart rate and blood pressure can keep up from uh, lying flat to standing up. So I'm going to talk to you about some very common causes of vertigo dizziness imbalance that I see in my clinic. I go through some cases. I think they, these are very typical cases. So number one is a 50-year-old lady. She will have brief spinning episodes whenever she lies back in bed or turns her quickly to one side when driving. And this started after she has a very minor head injury. And on my exam, she has a positive dix hall pike exam. And that means one of her inner ear is not working, causing her to have very brief dizziness. So her diagnosis is benign positional vertigo. It is one of the most common causes of recurrent vertigo. This uh, occurs occasionally. It's very short lasting for seconds. And uh, classically, it can be provoked by certain tilting positions. And the treatment is a particular exercise that I ask my patient to do. <coughs> so this is a picture of our, our inner ear. And our inner ear, there are an organ to, called utricle. In this location, there is some crystals responsible for our balance. Now, sometimes because of brief uh, a minor head injury, these crystals can go to the surrounding structure. And now, if that occurs when a patient is in a certain position, these crystals can cause dizziness. And then there is an exercise one can do to repair this. Let's see. So over here you can see these crystals 
in a semicircular canal. And this exercise is to reposition these crystals so it falls back to the correct place. Now she sits up, and these crystal has returned to their proper location. Case number two. So a 45-year-old gentleman had a flu-like symptom about a week ago, and then suddenly has vertigo, nausea, and problem with walking. Uh, he has a positive physical exam, indicating one of his inner ears is not working. So his diagnosis is vestibular neuritis. So this is due to reactivation of a common virus in the vestibular ganglion. It's part of the inner ear that connects the inner ear to the brain. And it is diagnosed by an astagmus on my exam. The symptom may, begins, may begin suddenly or slowly. However, this can be aggravated by head motion or seeing things in motion. Uh, this is a benign condition. It usually gets better in days to weeks. So try supportive treatment first. May consider a short course of steroids, and there are medications one can try for vertigo. This is a list for a uh, patient to try for vertigo, and these class are called vestibular suppressant. So that means they actually make your inner ear works less. In case of vestibular neuritis, one, of one side of the inner ear is not working, so these medication is to make the working side working less. So you, the brain, will incorporate signal better somehow. If you look at these medications, they all have side effects. And although I do not list them, the common side effect of all medication here is dizziness. Let's go on to the next case. 55-year-old lady has recurrent vertigos, hearing loss in one year. And these episodes may be triggered by stress. And these uh, can last a few days. And when these comes, um, the patient will have a lot of symptoms. Sometimes patient cannot get out of bed at all. And the diagnosis is Meniere disease. Usually for patients, when they come to see me for venereal disease, they have been diagnosed already. Uh, the episode may last hours to days and may be triggered uh, by stress. The, ideal, the cause is because for some, un for some unknown reason, the inner ear electrolytes are out of balance. The treatment is low sodium diet, water pill, and steroids. In severe cases, people have surgery for this. Uh, next case, 45-year-old gentleman with uncontrolled diabetes has been having leg numbness, tingling, and they're worse at night. Um, he says when he walks, he can trip easily in the dark. He can trip on his own foot, and he had trouble when walking outdoors. On his test, he had decreased sensation in the feet, and he had trouble standing straight up with his eyes closed. So he has neuropathy, or nerve damage from his uncontrolled diabetes. And this is caused by lack, lack of sensory feedback from muscle and joint. The treatment for this is to treat the underlying cause, in this particular case, control the diabetes. And there are exercises that you can do to improve the feedback from your muscle and joint. Case number five, 75-year-old lady with high blood pressure. She will feel lightheaded when she stand up, especially in the morning after waking up. Uh, she will have lightheadedness after uh, sitting up, uh, sorry, having sitting for a while and then stand up. So she feels this lightheadedness only lasts very briefly. It will go away on its own in second to uh, two minutes. And on my exam, I found her blood pressure drops when she changed from a lying position to a standing position. So she has the diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension. That means a sudden drop in blood pressure 
when a person sits up or stand up. This may be caused by a problem with your heart, nerve issues, hormonal issue, heart issue, or dehydration. The treatment for this is change position slowly, enough salt and water. You need both salt and water to keep your, to keep your blood pressure up. Compression stockings, and consider talking to your doctor about changing your medication or adding to your medication to, to ensure your blood pressure can hold up when you change positions. Uh, next case, 60-year-old gentleman came to emergency room with sudden onset of dizziness, vertigo, slurred speech, and left-sided weakness. An MRI showed this patient has a stroke. So in case of central vertigo, meaning dizziness that's caused by the brain, there are very common other associated symptoms. Fortunately, central vertigo is much, much less common than vertigo caused by the inner ear. Um, however, central vertigo is a rather broad diagnosis. It may be caused by stroke, hemorrhage, tumor, toxin, alcohol. And it may be due to genetic disease. And in those patients, they usually have a family history and issue with balance occur at a young age. Autoimmune disease such as multiple sclerosis and degenerative disease such as Parkinson's disease may cause imbalance in central vertigo. So how am I doing on time? Okay, okay. So I have two more cases, but these are controversial to say the least. 25 year old gentleman with a history of migraine. He has migraine before headache with vertigo. However, recently he, has, he said, I just have vertigo but no headache. So this patient has vestibular migraine. We don't know the cause. Migraine is a collection of symptoms, headache being the most common. However, the common uh, thing is our brain is hypersensitivity to something, to light, to noise, to motion. Uh, so the dizziness in case of vestibular migraine may or may not occur with headache. The treatment is to treat it like a migraine, a leaf, excedrin, medication like that. Next case, 45-year-old lady has been having floating, rocking sensation every day, almost all the time, for a few months. And it's worse when she's under stress. And this patient has chronic subjective dizziness. The cause is unknown. By definition, it lasts more than three months. It affects female more than males and uh, the symptom may be worsened by stress or sleep deprivation. And the treatment is to address the under underlying cause, stress, sleep deprivation, inner ear exercise may help, and sometimes antidepressant helps. So the last two diagnoses are controversial because there are a lot of overlaps. So again, um, I talk about uh, my thinking process when I see a patient with vertigo. I ask patient, what do they mean when you're dizzy? I do a targeted physical exam, and then based on the physical exam and history, I may or may not order tests for you. And I have go through the very common diagnosis that I see in my patient, in my clinic. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Our next speaker is Yolanda Mavity. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Yolanda Mavity is a Mavity is a physical therapist and the lead in the outpatient rehabilitation department in the West Tower here at Torrance Memorial. She's been practicing physical therapy since 2008 educated at Cal State Northridge and graduated with distinction. She has a clinical specialty credential in geriatrics and a keen interest in geriatrics and balance education. She's developed several balance classes that are run through Health Links, BEST, and Power Balance classes. She developed her interest in balance and physical therapy when she was a member of the USA National and UCLA gymnastics teams 
and enjoyed many international assignments. I don't know, I don't think she's going to tumble as she comes over here, but she will <laughs> now talk to Not us. today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's see if I can get this loaded up. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. All right. My name is Yolanda Mavity. I'm a physical therapist here at Torrance Memorial, as you've seen, uh, or been from the introduction. Thank you so much, Frank. I appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Huang, for your lecture. It was very informative. I'm going to try to complement the lecture a little bit here um, and then give you some things to help you diagnose your balance at home, whether or not you might need help from a doctor or physical therapist. So I wanted to give some background here. Um, because balance is a really important component of healthcare that I think is not as addressed or not as thought of as serious as what it really is. So studies link poor balance and increased risk of fall to serious injury and lifestyle <coughs> decline. Exercise balance training and fall prevention are a very important part of healthcare. Um, balance impairments can be caused by a variety of body systems and external causes as Dr. Huang has mentioned. And I'll go into some of the things here that he's probably covered more of the medical side and I'll cover more of the physical side of it. And then energy conservation can allow for more activity that you prefer doing. So we'll cover all of those areas. Falls are costly. One out of five falls causes a serious injury such as a broken bone or a head injury. And I'm going to kind of take some time on this slide because I want everyone to know how important it is. 95% of hip fractures are caused by falls, usually by falling sideways. Falls are the most common cause of traumatic brain injury. One in four people aged 65 and older falls each year. 50 billion is the total medical costs for Medicare in 2015. The Torrance Fire Department responds to at least 100 calls about falls per month. And I tried to confirm this with a Manhattan Beach firefighter today and asked what, uh, what he had. And he said, oh, I have a feeling they have a much higher fall rate on calls. The important part about this, though, is that not all falls are reported. So this is just a small portion of falls, and they can happen for a lot of different reasons. So the underreporting of falls, why don't we ask for help? There's a fear of growing old, fear of loss of independence, perceived peer judgment for using assistive devices to keep you upright and mobile. And I think a big one is the fear of losing the ability to stay in your own home. Fear of loss of quality of life. These are all really important things. And if there, you don't have a full understanding about the consequences of falls, these things can get worse. <laughs> this is my gymnastics background. I had to put her up. She's an 86-year-old gymnast. She is still competing today. And she is not falling right now. <laughs> so how do we balance? You, as Dr. Huang said, we use our vision, we use our muscle strength, vestibular inner ear, we went through that. Proprioception, that's the knowing where your body is in space. If I close my eyes and touch my nose, how do I know it's there? The skin and the muscles stretch behind me, I have experience. If I were to cut off my finger and try to touch my nose, how do I figure that out? That's where we can figure out how we know where our body is. And then another component is brain and memory. It's a manager of all systems. And I know we had a couple of people out doing handouts. Um, one of the things I really like is memory games. Because when I'm walking down the street, I have to remember that there's a curb here or a crack in the sidewalk, because otherwise I can trip and fall on it. So this is the basics of it, OK? It's not, you know, not talking about all the, the inner ear part of it, but what is our base of support? So, I'm going to have this be interactive with you guys. The people in the front row, if you don't have good balance, maybe just watch the part. But if you're in the rows behind, you can participate as you feel comfortable. Do not risk yourself falling, please. But you could hold onto the chair in front of you. But I want everyone to stand up, please.
I want you to look at your feet now. Okay? Some people are kind of like this. Some people are a little like this. Everyone kind of has a different. I have some people that have an assistive device like a walker or a cane. That is your base of support. You draw a circle around your feet and or your assistive device. This becomes our base of support, right? So if I draw a circle around my feet, that's it, okay? You also have a center of mass and gravity. You can sit down now. The center of mass and gravity is located generally right below your tummy, your belly button. And when that mass goes over your base of support, you fall, okay? This person's still balanced. So you can see the center of gravity here and that's the base of support of this person walking. But if it exceeds it, that's when you're going to fall. This is one of those lateral falls that causes the hip fractures. You can see the person kind of in that skiing pose. It looks like I'm going to fall over right now, right? I'm just about to exceed my base of support, and I'd have to take a step. So when we talk about it, some of you have this wide base of support. That's a strategy so you don't fall, right? And that's not a bad thing to do, but that's one of your first signals that maybe your balance is a little bit off. When you use the cane or the walker, that can help in a couple of ways. If I'm using the cane, that increases my base of support. I have a tripod here right now. It also tells me where the ground is. My hand is touching the, the cane, and we have very sensitive receptors in our hands. So you don't have to lean really hard on the cane, but it can tell us where the ground is. And it can make sure, oh, okay, I have to keep going. So it can just be something that gives your body information. Okay. So some of the first things that you can use to assess whether or not you need to see a doctor like Dr. Huang or come in for physical therapy are these. Do you furniture cruise? Do you touch everything that you're using, the walls, the chairs, right? Those are assistive devices. That is a clue that you might have a balance problem, and that's something you can probably get help with. Do you have a fear of falling? Just having a fear of falling makes you at risk for fall. So those are, again, things we can practice. Um, we're going to go into some of these tests in just a minute. Um, so you can also do some more self-diagnosis. But what I want you to do is pull out that questionnaire that I handed out at the very beginning. It's the study questionnaire. And I don't think I have one in front of me. I know we handed all of them out. Anyway, it's a big questionnaire. And I want you to look at it. You don't have to fill it out right now if you don't want to. Looks like this. Everyone has it? If you don't have it, you can kind of look up here. We can always get you. This is from the CDC. The CDC has a very important program called the STEADY program, and it's stopping elderly accidents, deaths, and injuries because they have such high consequences for people. If this is something that you can take at home, answer the questions. Have I fallen in the past year? Am I worried about falling? Do I have to rush to the toilet? There's a bunch of these. Do I take medications? If you score more than four points on this, you may have a balance problem and be at risk for fall. So it's a great assessment tool for you to use. The next thing, okay, we're going to do another little interactive por portion, okay? Again, only stand up and do this if you feel comfortable. So you can stand up. You guys are a good group of participants, thank you. The first way you do this, and you do this at home, again, always be safe is you try to stand with your feet together. If you can't do that right now, just leave your feet a little bit apart. That's OK. We don't want any falls here, OK? Can you do that, right? And you see how long you can hold that for. The next one is to move a foot a little bit in front of you. Can you do that, OK? And I would say try to do that for at least you know 15 to 30 seconds. You don't want to neglect the other side. So put your other foot in front. We, we self-select the side we like the best. 
So I see a couple people kind of wavering right now, and that's, that's important. So the next one's really hard. So please, again, don't try it here. You can try it at home. But you're, and I'll show you here. You're going to put one foot in front of the other. Now, that changes our base of support. It makes it very narrow, right? And don't tip anybody else over, you guys, OK? <laughs> if you can't hold this position for more than 10 seconds, you're at risk for fall. You have to be able to test the other side, too, because you can see that you have weaknesses in your body. We're not going to do the standing on one foot this time. That can come at a later lesson. But that's also a very good thing. One thing I do is I practice balancing. I brush my teeth standing on one leg. And sometimes I try to do it with my eyes closed. Oops. All right. So this is another test. I didn't put it in there. But this is something you might find if you come into a physical therapy clinic where we would ask you a bunch of things. And what I really like about this, you may sit down. Sorry, I have to tell everyone that, huh? Um, what I really like about it is it makes you think about what might cause a fall or what's difficult. And that can tell you, oh yeah, I'm not as confident as I, as I was. And this asks you, how confident are you that you will not lose your balance or become unsteady when? The first are pretty easy here, like walking around the house, um, walking up or down stairs, standing on your tiptoes to reach something above. Then it gets down to, and I really like this because I talked to my husband about this. I think that he needs to work on his balance a little bit, but don't tell him. Um, can you get onto an escalator? Do you hold the handrail? Right? Have you ever tried to do it holding a bunch of packages? That's a question on here. That's scary, right? So those are things that go away as we age because our balance becomes a little more impaired as we age. All right. I have a volunteer that I'm going to have come up for the next few minutes here. This is Trevor, everybody. And yes, I did pre-screen him. <laughs> have a seat here, Trevor. OK. So on this one, it's the kind of a go test. And I think you guys have this in your handout, too. You can practice this at home. So we're going to estimate, and I didn't measure it out, but you're going to come to about here, OK? So what I'm going to do is when I say go, I want him to stand up, walk to just about the end of the screen, turn around, and come and sit down. OK? You ready? Go. Yes. Beautiful. That was 8.83 seconds. So on this one, anybody who takes more than 12 seconds will be at risk for fall. I like this test because it's a really functionally based test to make sure that people can get up and move around and not be at risk. The turning is complicated. The getting up and down is hard for some people. But it's a really good test to know how that might work for you. OK. This is an activity, and I was going to have us do it, but I think I'm just going to have Trevor do this one, OK? All right, are you ready, Trevor? You're probably in for more than I asked you to do initially, but that's OK. <laughs> Maybe I'll pay him some money later on. OK, so what you're going to do is you're going to stand up and sit down as many times as you can in 30 seconds. Will you guys help me count, please? OK, here we go. Go. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, oh, getting tired. Eight, nine, ten, good. Woo. And stop. He gets a round of applause for that one. That was excellent. So on this test, and I think you guys have this on your handout also, there's your age group here. You don't have to tell anybody. You can do this test in the private, privacy of your own home. You can see how many you should be able to do. For the age group of 60 to 64, women should be able to do at least 12, OK? So you can go through that. And what I always tell my patients is I want them to shoot for the younger age group. So always keep this kind of functional balance in when you're when you're trying to stay steady. Are you rested? 
Okay, so I'm gonna give them one more chance to rest here for a second. There's other testing that we do in the clinic that can assess for balance problems. Um, sitting to stand, this is the Berg balance test, and I like that it brings up standing with eyes closed, right? And Dr. Huang brought that up. If you can't stand with your eyes um, closed, then you know there may be another system that's not operating properly. And so that's important. We will notice that. And if we think you need a vestibular evaluation, we'd send you to Dr. Huang or you know, maybe get a prescription for physical therapy for that. It talks about other things, turning around, looking behind your shoulder, reaching for things. These are all higher risk balance issues. And it, the tandem stance like we did in the four stage balance uh, stance and the single leg stance. So these are all things we can test. So now we're gonna do this one. This is a standard tool that we use in the rehab department. So I'm gonna show it to you real quick, it's very easy. Please stand up, good. So what I'm noticing is his legs are touching the chair. He probably doesn't need to, but that can be a, a source of support. His feet are pretty close together, so that's pretty good. Now put them all the way together, good. Close your eyes. Whew, he did it, good job, open your eyes, okay. Put your feet at a comfortable stance now. I'm gonna push you, don't fall, okay? I need to grade on that. Turn around in a circle, please. Good. Then we will also watch him walk. We've already seen him, you can go ahead and walk. We already saw him walk for the other test and then turn around and come back and sit down. Beautiful. So he would have scored a perfect score on this test, which is exactly what you want. But sometimes people have trouble shutting their eyes or they'll have to stand up using support. I know a lot of people who need to use their hands when they stand up. That can mean that you have mus muscle weakness and then maybe you can't support yourself when you're about to fall, okay? Please give a round of applause to Trevor. He did a great job. The other uh, test we do in the clinic has to do with functional mobility. And we call this the functional gait analysis. And this brings in a lot of components, again, that Dr. Huang brought up as far as turning heads and other things. So this is a 20 feet runway, if you will. And this is about a foot apart. So what we're doing is we're looking for how fast can you walk this? If you can't walk it in 5.5 seconds, then you can't cross the street before the hand signal goes off. If you can't change your speed going fast and slow, if you can't turn your head, you know, when I'm going to the grocery store, I need to be able to turn my head as I'm walking around. So those can be vestibular systems. They can also be um, imbalance related to neck problems. Uh, it talks about narrow base of support. Uh, it talks about doing a pivot turn. I've had people call, uh, fall when they went home and they forgot their keys and they turned and they fell quickly, you know, because they were going too fast. So anytime we have this, a score of less than or equal to 23 means you need to use an assistive device in the community. Um, I have a lot of patients, probably especially my male patients, that don't want to use a walker or a cane because of this perceived peer judgment. But if it's gonna keep you safe, you should use it. It's gonna make you move more and get out more and do more um, that you can do in the community. So don't be afraid to use that, at least temporarily until we can train you or long term to keep you safe. So can we practice? Yes, we can practice all of these things. You could use any of these tests or measures to practice. The four stage balance test is a great way to start. I can stand with my feet together and practice that until I get it down pat. Then I advance as I feel comfortable. Always use safe environment. Kitchen counter is a great place to use. You may be, oh, I'll do my balance test to, you know, while I'm cooking my lunch. I can stand tandem and be cooking or doing something. Um, use a bed if you're worried you're gonna fall backwards or ask for help. Always make sure that somebody's around you to keep you safe. So I like this too, again. So anybody over the age of 60 who's doing a beautiful yoga pose like this is wonderful. So she has her center of gravity over her base of support. And I wanted to talk really quickly about posture, and I always make this joke, I love it, but posture, number one, it allows for your vestibular system to be in the right position so that you can balance properly. 
I once had a patient who you know, walked in like this, and she said, I said, do you have any mirrors? Do you know what your posture is like? She had no idea, and so I got her upright. She goes, wow. And I tease my balance class. They say, why do I care about posture? What's important about it? And they give me all those answers about vestibular, and I can see things better and all that. And I said, no, it makes you look younger. <laughs> so it does allow for all of these things, though. It can help your brain communicate with your body better. It can use, using proper um, posture can allow for better gas exchange from your lung, better circulation from your heart. So you always want to really try to work on your posture and really get out of the posture that's forward like this. So there's other obstacles to good balance, and we've talked about a lot of these. Um, multiple medications, blood pressure like orthostatic hypotension, joint pain. Um, joint pain can actually inhibit muscles. Or if you have you know, meniscus problems, things like that can make a feeling of giving way. So if you do have joint pain, you definitely want to be assessed for that. And then you can get physical therapy to treat that. There's also muscle weakness and deconditioning. You know, we see patients who are being treated for cancer. They may have peripheral neuropathy related to cancer medications and other things. And so we can help them strengthen the other senses in order to help with their balance. And then multiple diagnosis. Maybe you have a couple things going on. So that's you know, all something we would work on your balance for. So what can you do here? Well, there's balance testing that we do at Torrance Memorial. You can either do it through the classes that are taught by the therapists that work in our offices. You can ask a doctor for a prescription. Or we have community classes, like they've had a lot of the flyers out in the front. So I just wanted to let you know that we do formal assessments um, for this. So if you ever need it, let us know. Um, we will help you. They do it through health links. You can make appointments to do it. Um, or if you're just wondering, have your doctor give you a prescription and we'll test you in the clinic. The CDC, I love their recommendations because they talk about exercise and all these other things, but one of the things they recommend is balance exercise two to three days out of the week. So that's another thing that you want to do. So the rehab services at Torrance Memorial, we're always here to help treat risk of fall. You do need a doctor's prescription, as I mentioned. We do accept a variety of insurance, and then balance is assessed as a part of every treatment we do. We watch how you walk in, and we see if you're at risk for fall. We do treat all these diagnoses, as we've talked about before. Um, we have a bunch of um, treatment where we treat people who have Parkinson's, um, vascular disorders, stroke, people are stroke survivors, traumatic brain injuries, et cetera. Oops. So here's some of the community programs that we offer through HealthLinks to help treat your balance. So we have a beginning balance class, and these are all taught by licensed therapists. Um, we have a fall prevention class. We have the best and the power balance class. Those are two classes that I started and my colleague has taken over, but these folks are so motivated and they come in and they learn a lot and their balance improves. We give exercises that are all related to different aspects of balance. Head turns, eyes closed, um, walking with a narrow base of support. So all of these things are covered. The beginning balance class really talks about how would you do curbs and stairs, how should you organize your home, you know, getting away area rugs or making sure things are well lit, um, making sure you have something if you're a furniture cruiser that you're going to make it so you don't trip or fall. The intermediate class is the best uh, balance class, balance, endurance, and strength training. And the last two classes here are set up in eight stations, and each station focus on, focuses on something that's related to balance. Um, we do, for the best balance test, require that Tenetti test that I showed you. Um, if, but if you score a certain level, then you're definitely eligible to take it, and it's a great class. And then the advanced balance class, this is really designed for somebody, probably like Trevor, who can get around in the community without an assistive device or just maybe a single point cane, but just notices his balance is getting worse. You want to keep whatever balance you have. And these are all taught by uh, licensed therapists. The last thing I kind of wanted to go over, and I tell my patients this a lot as we're going through things, you want to look at the energy conservation in the five Ps. And I'll go through these real quickly, but planning, pacing, prioritizing, positioning, and purse lift breathing. So planning, you should take a look at your day in the morning or your week and see if you're lumping together things that are very physically demanding 
or mentally demanding, then maybe you want to spread them out. Let's say I have three doctor's appointments in the morning, but I still need to grocery shop. Well, I'm going to be carrying groceries at the end of the day, and maybe that's my, not my strongest time. I don't have my hands to help you. I can't use my assistive device maybe then. So maybe you do the three doctor's appointment and then go home and pay the bills and go grocery shopping tomorrow. It's OK to revise your plan, too. You may have something that comes up that just really makes you tired, either mentally or physically. Take a second, see how you're feeling, and then revise. Also, find locations where you can sit and rest if necessary. I have a lot of patients who have difficulty exercising because they need to sit and rest in between. Sometimes I tell them to go to the mall. There's benches every 50 feet or so, and that's well lit. There's no tripping hazards. If you go early in the day, there's not many people there. So there's lots of things you can do for that. Pacing. Take enough time to do each project. Don't say, I'm going to go to the grocery store in 30 minutes, and then I'm going to go mow my lawn, and then I'm going to clean my garage out, and I'll get that done within an hour, right? You have to know how much time it's going to take. So make sure you don't rush through it. Avoid multitasking when you're fatigued. That can cause falls also. Too many things going on at once. And then, again, pace everything and plan it throughout the day. Prioritize also. So again, everybody's different in when they're strongest. So sometimes I have a patient that say, I'm best in the mornings. That's when you do your physically balanced, challenging things, like the grocery shopping, like the things, you, you know, the gardening, whatever it is. Sometimes you're better in the afternoon. Do those things at the time that your brain is best, right? And avoid doing complicated tasks when you're stressed or mentally there's too much going on. Because again, falls can cause, be caused by that. And then consider delegating tasks that aren't important to you. Sometimes you might say, you know, I can't get my house clean because I just get too tired. Maybe it's time to hire a house cleaner or somebody to help you. Maybe it's time to hire someone to mow the lawn for you. Just say, don't do the roses. I want to do the roses. That, you know, you have to choose those things that are most important for you. And then positioning. When you position things in the kitchen, for instance, put them at a place that's easy to reach. And this is one of those things. Why, do, why would we care about where I would position something? Well, I get patients that have problems getting their shoulders past here. And I have to lean way back to get something high up. And they fall backwards. So you want to have something positioned where you can easily reach it. I don't want to have to stand on a chair and risk falling to get something out of my highest cupboard. But maybe I ask my son to come over to, hey, can you get this out for me? Keep yourself safe. Don't risk a fall because the consequences are high. And then pursed lip breathing. I think this is just important because it really helps with proper gas exchange in our lungs. If you smell the flower, blow out the candle. It allows for a longer exchange coming out so that you have pressure in your lungs to have better oxygenation. Oops. If you have any questions, call us. And I had to say, these are my kids that helped me through this whole process. Sean and Connor, I think they're so cool, so I had to show them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Those were two excellent talks. We will now have about a 10 minute break. Members of the Miracle of Living Planning Committee will be circulating through uh, the audience uh, with paper and pencils. You can write your questions on the paper and after the break, we will uh, ask a few questions of our speakers. So we're adjourned for about 10 minutes. All right, I'll try to uh, group similar questions together so that we can save a little time. We have uh, two questions asking about manganese. Does it, uh, does it, is it effective for vertigo uh, or dizziness or similar afflictions? Well, the answer is yes, because uh, manganese is a heavy metal. If you have occupational exposure, you can accumulate in your brain and they can impair the sense of balance. Okay. Strobe lights or bright lights? Two different questions of essentially the same. Strobe lights or bright lights make me dizzy. Uh, please comment on this. What causes it? 
and what's this, what the significance is. So you may have the instance of vestibular migraine. So again, migraine is a hypersensitivity syndrome. That means your brain is sensitive to input. Uh, people can have ocular migraine, meaning they have uh, visual changes without headache. So I think in this case, perhaps because your brain is sensitive to these input from light, strong lights, and cause you to have vestibular migraine. Okay, um, is vestibular migraine the same as optical migraine? With what migraine? What's the second optical? one? Optical. Optical. No, so optical migraine is ocular migraine. Ocular migraine means there are patients who have visual changes without headache. These are usually described to me as seeing wavy lines in their vision. Sometimes they have trouble focusing. They have a uh, dark spot in their central vision. Without headache, that comes lasting about 30 to 15 minutes and then going away. Vestibular migraine is patient may have sense of dizziness lasting very briefly and then just goes away. Okay, now we have some questions about exercise. Uh, one, uh, how does Tai Chi compare to balance classes for effectiveness? And a couple of people would like to know after they've done their exercises and things have improved, do they need to keep doing that for forever and ever? All right, so I'll answer this one because I do a lot of the exercise. There is great evidence uh, that Tai Chi can improve balance, so it's a great exercise to do. I do think that HealthLinks offers Tai Chi, and there's lots of community programs that are based with that. Um, as far as the question, if you have to stop your exercises, you know, if you're talking about vestibular exercises, oftentimes the exercises that Dr. Huang showed can solve the problem for what's happening now. You may have to return to it if the crystals um, are knocked loose again. Um, as far as the balance exercises I was going through, you want to keep those up. Um, you don't want to give up your balance ever. You know, Again, I talk about I practice my balance every single day. And the people who have come into our balance classes and you know they, they take it and they practice it all the time, their balance, they do pretty well on their balance. But you do have to keep those up. The next one is uh, more of a statement than a question, but I think it's uh, certainly deserving of attention, and I'll ask our speakers to comment if they choose afterwards. This is an emergency medical technician with 35 years of experience, and he's he or she has worked many events, and the majority of falls I've seen or near, near syncope are triggered by dehydration. In many cases, the person came to the event already dehydrated. Please stress hydration as a means of prevention. Have I done that, or do we, you want to add to that? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good point. Um, would excess fluid on the brain cause dizziness or memory loss? What do you mean by that? Uh, that's be 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 because when you say excess fluid in the brain, that may mean different things. Um, our brain already has fluid surrounding it. When you say excess, um, so this is kind of difficult to answer the question. Sometimes, uh, well, a lot of times when we get old, our brain naturally shrinks. So on the imaging study, it seems like there is excess fluid. In, actually, in actuality, there is not. It's just there is more brain shrinking, make it seem like there is excess fluid. And then there is a rather uncommon condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And this condition uh, generally causes pro a problem with memory uh, and problem with balance as well. However, that's a rather uncommon diagnosis. OK, now, Dr. Wang, uh, have you got uh, some handouts in the back? I don't know whether, because there are some people who would like to contact you. And also, uh, can Kaiser refer patients to you? Um, no. I'll make a comment about the handouts really quickly. I think in the beginning they said we were running out of handouts and that they, and tell me if I'm wrong, they would mail to you if you got your addresses. So if you didn't get a hand, handout, go see Mary in the very back and give her your address and she will mail you any handouts. 
Okay, next, does ringing in the ears affect balance? Not necessarily, because our inner ear really is, consists of two organs. One is the semicircular canal, and these are for motion. And there are the labyrinths which are responsible for sound. So if you have ringing in your ear, you may not have problem with balance. Does oral calcium have any effect on inner ear crystals? Oral calcium? Supplements. Supplements. Okay, I see. So uh, if we're talking about the diagnosis of benign positional vertigo, the most common reason why these crystals become loose is because your head bumped something. You fell. Sometimes even maybe minor things like I opened a cabinet door and it bumped my head. However, these crystals in the utricle, they rest on a bed of jelly-like substance. And these uh, substance are, fee are fed by a very tiny blood vessel. So if you have uh, small vascular disease, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, it can cause these jelly-like substance um, to have damage, and this crystal will fall away. Another uh, theory is these crystals are actually bone-like material. If you have osteoporosis, you are more prone to have these crystals falling off in the wrong place. What would you recommend for a person who has no symptoms but is going on a cruise and is perhaps counting on getting dizzy? <laughs> I'll answer that question. You should practice your balance now. You should practice standing on one leg or practice at a counter. Anytime you can strengthen your muscles and your uh, system to balance better, you're going to balance better when you go on a cruise. I agree with that. So the sense of balance is actually an ability that we can practice. So if you can get into a balance program, it will help you to cope better and enjoy your cruise better. Uh, question, is this event available on YouTube? That I don't know. I do know that it's available at the Torrance Memorial website for about one year after the um, event itself. And you go to, uh, I believe it's torrancememorial.org slash MOL for Miracle of Living and follow some links there and you'll be able to find it. It'll probably be up in a few days. Um, could you give some examples of exercises for neuropathy? Um, yes, so for a patient who come into my clinic, well actually, where do I I, I'm happy to answer this question. We have lots of patients that come in with neuropathy. It means that your senses in your feet, you, you can't feel them quite as much as before. And then you have to really strengthen your muscles and your other senses to compensate. So when you're walking, you're going to want to use your vision to look down at the ground because your feet are not necessarily going to feel what is happening. If I'm walking on grass, for instance, versus concrete versus carpet. So if you can strengthen and say, OK, I'm going to look down. And then, of course, you want to strengthen your memory because you need to be able to remember these things. You know, I'm, I don't want to trip over the curb that I can't feel. But if I look at it and remember it, I won't trip over it. So all of those things, vision and then inner ear, you can even strengthen the, how, the response of it. Um, so for my patient who come in with balance issue due to peripheral neuropathy, I tell them two things, basically what you said. Look before you go and be mindful when you walk. Uh, if an inner ear crystal can be repositioned by rolling your head around, what keeps those crystals from being displaced when you roll over in bed at night? Oh, actually, the answer is nothing. So that means when you, once you have this particular condition, they're prone to reoccur. So just practice, practice, practice those. Correct. Head um, maybe we've covered this. Please give examples of exercises for peripheral neuropathy. I, I think we covered that in the last question. Uh huh. Um, let's see. What is your opinion of spring-loaded step stools or small step ladders with and without rails? I'll take this one if that's okay. Um, 
I would be very careful about going anything that's going to be spring loaded, and I'm not sure if that was a joke or not, but um, you want to be able to hold on to something that you're going to do. You want to make sure that you don't have a fear of falling. But even so, I have patients all the time tell me who have very poor balance, I'm going to go up into my attic on my A-frame ladder, and it makes me very nervous because the risk of falling is so high. Um, so you always want to make sure you're doing something very safely, and I wouldn't do anything that's going to make a ladder move or not move. You want to make sure you're holding on to something with your hand. If you have any kind of hand problems, though, you could lose your grip and also fall. So, you know, when in doubt, ask for help. Um, I'm okay normally, but lose my balance when getting up at the night to use the bathroom. Comments? Um, so in this particular case, there may be two issues. So one is peripheral neuropathy, nerve damage. So we saw when you're getting up in the middle of the night, the room may be dark, so you don't have the visual system to help you to tell you where the floor is. So if that is the cause, then I advise you to have a night light or even have a commo at the bedside. The other possibility is at night you're lying flat, you stand up, your blood pressure drop, that's another possible cause of issue with dizziness and balance. Would medical marijuana help in any way? <laughs> Not as far as I know. I don't think there's any medical evidence in treating vertigo. I have not seen any medical evidence either. What do you, th what do you think of the value of Arnica or Arnicare gel for relief of muscle pain? I don't know what that is. I have an opinion, I guess, about, you know, there's people that use Icy Hot or they'll use Salon Paws or those kind of things. I if you think it works, use it. Um, if you're going to get a skin condition, don't. But sometimes for joint pain and muscle pain, you know, just the act of rubbing your muscle can make it feel better. But it's like ice or heat or anything. If, if that will reduce your pain, I, I would say go for it. But if it's not doing anything, then, you know, that's up to you. Uh, my wife lost her hearing in her right ear after a bout with vertigo that lasted a week. Uh, what are the possibilities of this potentially happening to the other ear? Um, that depends. So it seems like this particular condition is a permanent um, damage. So that may be caused by vascular issue, blood vessel issue, or autoimmune issue. So it really depend on depending on what the issue is um, and to prevent the cause to affect the other ear. Okay. Uh, when my father looks up, he gets dizzy and starts to shake and leans on the counter, lasting about 30 seconds. After that, he is fine. Comments? Uh, well, I think I'll refer him to see Yolanda. Sometimes you can get up fast, and that could be orthostatic hypotension, or sometimes you can get up fast and your joints can be very stiff. If your joints are very stiff, that can cause pain, and that could cause shaking also. Um, so, you know, he may want to just do some seated range of motion exercises before he gets up, but absolutely refer him for medical treatment if um, that's something that would cause a fall. Uh, the next question refers to contact lenses, but I think it could just as well apply to regular glasses. Uh, what about uh, when you get your prescription changed? How does that uh, affect you, the, the ba your balance? Well, so with a prescription change, you may have trouble with perception of depth. So that means you may have, uh, you may have to learn again how to judge depth, meaning where is the step? Is this step going to be a correct? Am I going to trip over myself? The other thing with vision, and I've experienced this myself, if you have bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, when you look down, that's sometimes through the, the part of the lens that's going to bring something closer so you can read it. And it can make you trip because all of a sudden you're looking down and it's a different lens than what you're seeing. So you, doctors, the eye doctors usually say, you know, take your glasses off or use the handrail when you're going downstairs because that can really cause a fall also. Okay, the next question about the condition of lightheadedness when rising up uh, from a sitting or a lying position, assuming that the blood pressure drops 
to cause the condition, but would extended aerobic exercises help this condition? Perhaps. Um, however, in my opinion, in my personal experience, the most common cause of this particular condition is blood pressure medication. So you may need to look over your medication, talk to your primary care doctor, and see if there are any particular medication that's responsible for this condition. Uh, personally, a personal note here, it took about four different um, tries with different blood pressure medications before I found one that didn't make me dizzy, so keep trying. There's probably one out there. Yes. Okay, and last question, is it possible for vertigo and imbalance uh, to occur at the same time? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, you can have something wrong with the vestibular apparatus and have peripheral neuropathy or have weakness. There's m many things, comorbidities that can happen with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that concludes our questions because we don't have any more. Before you run away, whoever owns this cell phone, please come and get it. And tune in again next month. The subject is osteoporosis. As always, or nearly always, the third Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. here in this room. See you then.